My active addiction spanned 12 years in my hometown. I had gotten to a point where even though I had all these memories growing up in this area, you know, all this love, first dates, high school dances, football games, just growing up, which is supposed to be the best days of your life, became so clouded with so many memories of, of suffering and, and hell, real hell. I was at a friend's house and we had been kind of on like a binge for the last couple days and I remember I just didn't feel very well and I, I wanted to get high and he was like okay I have heroin if you're willing to try this and administer it to yourself then he was willing to give it to me for free I remember him sucking it up into the syringe for me putting it in my hand once I ingested it I just laid back you know now I'm okay now I'm normal I had thought I needed this substance for the rest of my life just to be okay I had tried to get clean in that area time and time and time and time again, uh, futile every time. You know, I remember it going from weed to opiates kind of overnight. Anytime I tell somebody I'm a heroin addict, the first response I always get is, oh, you don't look like a heroin addict. It doesn't care if you're white or black or you come from the suburbs or the inner city. It doesn't discriminate. What I experience being in a small town is that I wanted to be in everybody's group and there just wasn't enough things to do. So drugs made everything a little bit more interesting, a little bit more fun and fast moving. Inner city drug dealers actually start to migrate their business, if you will, out to these um, smaller towns where there's less authority and more money basically. And you have, you know, kids like me that were just ready to latch on to anything that gave them a sense of pleasure or just excitement or anything like that. I'm a derelict, a waste of space and time. And I know this is not the way my father taught me to grow. Not even close. I had accepted the fact that I would never see my family again and that the next time that, that, my, that my family saw me you know, would be to identify my body. It got so bad that, that I truly um, had gotten to the point where I didn't think I was even going to take another shower before I died. The greatest thing that my parents ever did was cutting me off completely, 100%. You know, everybody is worried about their reputation and, and what other people are thinking about them. People become so concerned with what their neighbors are talking about that they don't even want to go reach out for help. And it also prevents providing these resources. It's like we want to close our eyes to it and act like it's not there. Coming from that small town, you had to go elsewhere to find the kind of help that was sufficient or necessary that somebody early on really needs to look up to and to understand what they need to do. It's free, you know, and it's just a group of people that have been where you're at and know your story and know how you felt and how you feel. It was done for them, and now they're freely giving it to you. If I can go out and do that for somebody else that doesn't, that, that's out there right now and doesn't think that they're going to come back, if I can go out and do that for them like it was done for me, it's all worth it. today to be able to talk to my grandfather and, and have conversations with my mother and my sister and go out and be with them is like a constant reminder of how much better my life is now that I'm not using heroin. It's definitely been my driving force, especially through the hardest times of recovery and, and even the darkest days of addiction, really. Yeah, I'll be damned if I die a junkie. I'll be damned if my children bury me I'll be damned if I die all alone while the world spins around So here I sit and here I'll stay A better man than yesterday Don't cut me down